This is a magnificent miracle story. Tonight, we're going to take a look at scripture and so far as how John the evangelist constructed this gospel. Then we're going to talk about doctrine. What is the doctrine regarding the resurrection? And then I'm going to talk to you. We'll give you some legal and medical advice. How's that? <laughs> and you'll get my bill in the mail. John's gospel is divided into two parts, the book of signs and the book of glory. This is the last and greatest sign of Jesus in John's gospel. There were seven other signs, seven other miracles. Remember last week, of course, we had the blind man, and that's fantastic. The reason for these signs, these miracles, is to point out that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, and you hear attestation to this already in the gospel. We've come to believe that you are the Christ, that you've come from God. This miracle of raising someone from the dead, if I may quote Ed Norton from The Honeymooners, this was the coupe de grasse. <laughs> what do I mean by that? The other miracles certainly got people's attention. They also began to get Jesus noticed by the Jewish authorities and even by the Roman authorities. This Jesus was gaining in popularity and people were talking about him. The news was all over town. As I told you many times, just because we have Twitter, that doesn't mean that news travels any faster. It travels. And it travels all throughout the Holy Land and people coming into Jerusalem from the Roman Empire, the trade, they also had been hearing about Jesus. This miracle of raising Jesus from the dead finally stirs up the authorities so much that now we begin to hear about plots, serious plots, to kill Jesus. And this story then leads us to the second part of John's gospel called the Book of Glory. In the next two weeks, next week is Palm Sunday, and then Holy Week, we come to the high point of the gospel because Jesus' glory is manifested on the cross. In John's theology, John says the cross is the high point of Jesus' ministry because then on the cross, he reveals himself as the Son of God. Truly, this man was the Son of God. Now, let's talk a little bit about what happened to Lazarus, and then we're going to talk about what happened to Jesus when Jesus rose from the dead. These are two distinct moments, and they're not the same. You see, Lazarus died. As a matter of fact, he really died. They kept him in the tomb for four days. Why? That's to make sure that you really are dead. In those days, they didn't have the medical equipment that we have today, and so somebody might have been buried prematurely. You may have read about these stories. He's dead four days, and the body begins to decay. And here, you know, the sisters saying, uh, Jesus, if we open this tomb, there's surely a stench in there. This is to tell us that he really did indeed die. Jesus then says, roll the stone back, and then he begins to call to him, Lazarus, come out. Now, Lazarus does come out, bound hand and foot. This is resuscitation. This is resuscitation. 
it means that the human body of Lazarus was brought back to life. Maybe you've had experiences yourself. Dying once is difficult enough. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he was going to die again. That's resuscitation. And I have seen this many times in the hospitals where someone has died, heart stops beating, and then the defibrillator comes and electric shocks come and the compression of the chest by the staff and the person sometimes comes back. So they died, but they came back again. And then of course, sometimes I wonder if Jesus or the doctors really do people a favor because once you come back, you have to die all over again. You understand what I'm, what I'm saying here? So this is resuscitation. There is a great difference between resuscitation and resurrection. And that's why we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and not the resuscitation of Lazarus. It's only a story, a miracle story, that points out to the power that Jesus has over our human nature. Well, what about resurrection? Resurrection is a new form of existence. It's not resuscitation. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was never going to die again, and he is alive now. And he is no longer subject to sickness, to pain. But he lives a new existence. That's resurrection. And that's what we hope to share in, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A lot of people wonder, and this becomes very, very theologically difficult to explain, they wonder, well, what is going to happen to us? at the resurrection, what is going to happen to us. The key to this is very, very deep. It's that the resurrection of Jesus is now because there is no time with God. A lot of us fall into the trap of what we call platonic dualism. It means that, well, the body really isn't good but the spirit is. And so we often may see uh, portrayals of a bird that flies away from the body because the body held them down over the years. The body caused them problems, pain. Instead, this spirit flies away, this soul flies away. I remember having a a number of years ago, and one of the funeral directors was extremely uh, creative. He knew how to turn a book. Uh, he used to bring a cage with him to a funeral, and after the funeral mass, he had two doves in the cage, or a dove, a dove in the cage. Two, in case one of them refused to get out. They could be stubborn, right? And when we would bring the coffin outside of the church, he would open the cage, take out a dove, and let it fly. This is the soul flying up to God. It's Platonic dualism. It's pagan. It's pagan. You see, well, let me tell you this one thing. One day, the dove refused to leave and sat on the branch of a tree. And the, the woman who passed away, her daughter said, you see, mom doesn't want to leave us. Okay. The soul and the body are one. And that's why Christianity, Christianity has such an emphasis on respect 
for the human body. Such an emphasis on respect for the human body because all of us is saved in the resurrection. It's not just a soul that escaped from a cage, but it is our whole self, body and soul, that is going to share in the resurrection at the end of time. As I said, what is the resurrection? The resurrection is now because Jesus lives and we die in Christ. We die in Christ. So as the scriptures say, everyone is alive in God. We are alive in God. So much for that, we could talk a lot more about this, but it's extremely important. I'm going to talk to you just, I hope, briefly about um, people who are at the end of life. People who are at the end of life. Uh, I hope that all of you have a will. I hope that all of you have a durable power of attorney. That means somebody who could sign for you when you sit or to pay your bills. I hope that all of you have a living will to talk about what you want and what you don't want and have a health care proxy. You know what that is? That's someone who could make decisions for you in the hospital when you can't make decisions on your own. And your healthcare proxy should know what your mind is regarding end of life issues. Now, unfortunately, I have had to deal with end of life issues many, many times. As the years have gone by, technology has become more sophisticated. And we could keep people alive, or at least breathing, for a long time. There comes a point, though, in many cases, where the care becomes what we call futile, futile care. And when the doctors and the staff come to this conclusion that continuing, for instance, keeping somebody on a respirator is futile, then it comes time for a conversation with the family and most especially the healthcare proxy. So what happens then? The family has to agree that when the point comes or is futile, where the respirator is but keeping a body alive that is not going to survive, then the question is, can we disconnect? And the answer is, yes, we can. As a matter of fact, most of the time, yes, we should. Yes, we should. Always difficult for families to make that decision. But the healthcare proxy can because they know the person and what the person's wishes would be in that situation. The hospitals do a marvelous job with this. Once the decision is made, the human person, the body, is given the utmost care to make sure that there is no pain and that the family is part of the process. So what will happen? The respirator will, be, respirator will be removed. With the family's permission, the respirator will be removed. And then, to make sure there is no pain on the person who is dying, they will administer morphine, as much as needed, so that the person literally is feeling no pain. The family will be there. The hospitals will supply food for the families because once the respirator is removed, it could be an hour, a couple of hours, or even a day before the person's heart stops beating. But remember, the person is dead. The brain waves, for the most part, are gone. And then the person dies peacefully. I tell you this why. Because our life here on Earth is not forever. And these are issues that we have to deal with. And when we talk about these end of life issues, I want you to reflect on Lazarus. I think that 
uh, had he known about it, uh, he would have told me to put a DNR on him. You know what that means? Do not resuscitate. And those are one of the things that we have to deal with at the hospital with a healthcare proxy, that a person is not going to be brought back when the person is dying and is futile. So having said that, I hope this helps you tonight. What I want you to do, make sure you have a will, durable power of attorney, living will, and a healthcare proxy. And when you make out the will, my name is spelled O-R-S-I. God love you. <laughs>